All right, Python tuples. It's the next collection type in this series. Um, I assume that you've done lists already, uh, at least lists already, and so tuples will be very similar to lists. Um, and we'll take a look at them. I'll do it by example, like I did the last one, and um, I don't think we should be able to quickly run through them because they're very similar. So let's get going, right? On it here. So once again, I'm following the same format. I have created a function. <laughs> I'm using the same function. I just changed the name, right? So it's called my tuple function. And it's a notes at the top here that um, you, you should recognize as things that are different. <laughs> so these are qu these qualities of the, uh, of, of the uh, tuple, right? And so duplicate elements are allowed. So you'll notice that I have this 108 element twice in here. And that's going to be OK. It's not a problem. Uh, the elements are ordered, which means that I can expect that they're going to be in the order at which I created the list, at which I created the list. So if I look for the 0th using the index, the first one, the first element, the first element will always be 7. The elements, uh, they are indexed, so we're going to start at index 0 and, and go through. Uh, but they are not mutable, okay? So that's, that's, a, that's a difference right there. Uh, why would we want that? <coughs> well, oftentimes, uh, when we're programming, uh, we, we want to name data, right? And so we use variables to do that. And this is nothing more than a variable, it's just a variable that, that can have multiple pieces of data in it, rather than the standard variable, which would be um, maybe an int or something, right? So maybe price oranges equals, I don't know how much an orange costs, <laughs> 225, $2.25, right? So rather than, uh, I wouldn't want to write $2.25 all over the program if I'm doing calculations with that price. So I would put it in a variable, and it reads better that way, too. So I would say the total price would be price orange times num oranges, right? And that reads kind of English-like, and, and is, is a way for us to be able to read the code better. And uh, we may, in, in some variables, this is a good example, because I, I use two variables there, the price of an orange and the number of orange, or num oranges, I say. So in those two variables, the variables because I, I can assign a value to that name, right? And it's we're treated as a box that's holding some value. Um, these things are mutable, meaning they can be changed, these variables. So it's possible for me in the code to uh, assign a different value to that variable than, than, what, was initial, than what it was initialized to when I declared the variable. Um, I, I, if you think about it a little bit, it's while num oranges for a client, uh, a customer that's coming into maybe our fruit stand or something, num oranges could be different for everybody. And so that's truly variable, right? It's changing all the time depending on the customer. But the price of orange does not change. It's not really a variable, but I still would like to name it so that I get my code more readable. And you know, it makes perfect sense to, to call it price orange, right? So really, I would like to use a variable that's immutable for the price of the orange, but mutable for num oranges. So two different kinds of variables I want. I do appreciate that I, I can name the data across both variables, right? Both variables allow me to name the data. That's useful. Uh, but it, I really don't want price of orange to be inadvertently changed somewhere, you know? Uh, I could do it as the programmer very easily and, and accidentally. And, and I, I don't want to open up that. Imagine if there are 40,000 lines of code and I've been working for 12 hours on this code and I get way to the bottom, I'm exhausted, I want to go to bed and, and I, I start making mistakes. And I make the mistake of inadvertently changing the price of an orange, right, on, on line 38,200. And, and then when I run the program, the next day, <laughs> uh, 
there's an error. It's not coming up right. It's not calculating the price of oranges properly, or the total the total bill properly. So um, now I've got to try to find that. And it really was just a mistake. It was an accident, right? So I'd really like to avoid being able to do that. And since the price of the orange really shouldn't be changing, not in the program. Um, if, if, if the actual price, due to inflation or something, that arises of the price of an orange, then someone should come into the program and, and actually modify that intentionally, not um, in some other manner, right? So we really want that to be constant. Whereas the number of oranges, we really don't want that to be constant. So this is, I guess, an idea. A way for you to think about why I would want something to be mutable and why I would want something, a variable, to be immutable, right? And so that's what we have going on here. The list, remember, the elements, the individual elements, are mutable. So we can change them. We notice that. We can change them using the index um, to whatever we want. We can assign a different value. And by the way, just, for a, just to make note of it, uh, we can change the, the element in a list to any data type, right? So I could change, for instance, sys103, the third element. I could change it to 4, the integer 4 if I wanted. It started out as a string, sys103, and I could change it to the integer 4 if I wanted, right? So I could do all kinds of things, being able to unmute this. In fact, I could change that element three uh, in a list to another list. So there could be a list contained inside the list. Each one of these elements could be their own list. So I could have multiple lists inside the list. Right, all of this is possible. And, and so what we get with a tuple is most of all the benefits of the list, the ease of use, the, the ability to access uh, the list using an index. But we also, it provides the ability for us to um, make the, the individual data elements immutable. So that they can't be modified. Once we set them up, they are what they are. Right? And so these things are all going to work as usual, right? These prints, because nothing has changed in that respect between a tuple and a list. Right? So, oh, one thing that did change, though. Remember, it's not because I used the word tuple in the variable name. That's just something I did. I made that name up. I could have called it classes. I wouldn't need, I don't need to have any indication whatsoever that, that this data is part of a tuple in the variable name. It is convenient to do that. Then by reading the code, I can tell that that's a tuple. Uh, and it, no matter where that variable is used in the code, uh, right here at the declaration, it's easy to see that it's a tuple, and it's easy to see because of uh, the fact that tuples use a comma-separated list of elements, just as lists do, but in a tuple, we're going to use parentheses to wrap up that comma-separated list. Right? So it's clear when I look at this that this is a tuple, it's not a list. Um, but it wouldn't be later in the code, for instance, let's go down to, we know that I have this this return down here. So you wouldn't know by looking at this line of code that my tuple <laughs> is a tuple had I not used the word tuple in it. Right? If I had just used classes was my variable name, then you wouldn't know just by reading that line of code. And so then we would we could always use the type function though. But this is why we name variables appropriately. So that so that the, the name of the variable reflects the contents or the value that's contained or, or in, the, in the variable itself. Right? So I used the name here that reflected what was in the variable. And what's in that variable is a tuple. So I call it just my tuple. All right. <laughs> so let's, let's run these couple prints here and we'll see what, what we kind of know what's going to happen here, though, right? Uh, we know from list what happens. Type returns, and we know the formatting which type returns. It's going to say class equals, and in tick marks, which are like the little quotes, um, it's going to read tuple. I, I, I think we're going to see what like it calls tuple, but I think it calls it tuple with a lowercase t. When we click, uh, when we when 
this one prints my tuple printout. My tuple, this this tuple gets sent to print. It's gonna it's gonna print exactly this right? in the same form that it is that I wrote it. Right, and then uh, length of my tuple. Well. So we know what this is going to be too. I just have to double check something. Sorry. There's one, two, three, four, five, six elements. So we expect this printf to, to print six. So let me make a call to this. I don't know if I executed here yet or not. So make that execution and. So maybe this has happened to you guys before. I probably should have this on. I probably am going to have to now redo this video again, but let's see. Um, all right. So I, I, I'm glad this just happened. It's a silly mistake, uh, but, but at least you can see me kind of debug. Um, it's saying that my tuple function is not defined. And I'm looking at this saying, well, here's the definition right here. And what this means is I never pushed this button. <laughs> so it never, I, I modified it and saved it, but I didn't push that, that button. So now we'll run this again. And there we see what um, we're supposed to see. It is class tuple, just as expected from the first print. The second print, we want to print out the tuple. There it is in the same format that I created it with all the elements listed there in order, right? That's important to recognize. The seven is exactly the way that I, I did it, right? They're all in the same order, right? And there are six elements. That's what we thought. I count them out one through six. They have an index of zero, right? One, index two, index three, index four, index five. All right. So, so far everything works the same. So we'll do like we did before and eliminate um, the excess printing since we already know what they're going to do so we don't have too much printing going on around here we could leave those but we won't so now one thing that we know is it's unmutable right the tuple so I'll tell you what, what's going to happen here it's not that we can't access it is indexed All right? if you see right here I, I've made a note of it it's indexed so we can use index we can use its, its index like right like like i'm going to do right here where is it right here i'm using the index zero i'm trying to print out what's in index zero of my tuple uh the thing is accessing and overriding or or mutating right so so when i just try to print something i'm not changing it right as in so I, i'm i'm allowed to look but i can't mute i can't change them they're immutable. All right, so this is going to be okay. Right? And this is going to be okay. Because I'm allowed to do that. Uh, and I'll be able to see the type. So we'll go ahead and finish that, that little run right there. Okay, let's push this button so we don't get that error again. Okay, uh, there's a seven in the first spot, right? We see it up there. You can see it there, right there, right? So there's a seven there, and then uh, in the third one, zero, one, two, three, there's a sys 106. There we go, that's what we printed. And it prints the type as expected, as a class str, string is what we have there. All right, so this all worked as we would expect based on what we've learned with lists. And here is where the difference is coming up next. Let's just ditch this. So it's out of the way again. We'll get that one too. And here, I'm using the assignment operator, right? The equal sign. And I'm trying to assign a five to 
index zero of the variable my tuple. Okay, so I'm trying to overwrite what's in index zero with a five. And so that's gonna be problematic. It's not gonna let me go any further than this. I'll go ahead and, and release this one too, but it won't even go there. Uh, we, it'll, it'll, it'll be able to print what's well, going to do. It's going to throw an error right here. Whether it even goes any further, I, I doubt. I don't know. We're going to see. It might stop right there. Uh, but if it goes any further, we're st it's still going to print the seven because the seven is not going to be overwritten, right? Because it's, it's not allowed. That's not allowed. And then the type is going to be int for what's in element zero. So boom. And then boom. So there's my error, which is expected. It's on my tuple zero equals five. This or assigned to my tuple zero, location zero in my tuple, uh, a five. Um, tuple object does not support item assignment. Okay, so we cannot assign to a tuple element. The object itself doesn't, doesn't permit that kind of operation and we knew that right that was one of the that's the difference so and and also note let's let's both let's all note you guys and me that it did that that broke the program right there it stopped right on that line and we did not make it to this one there's nothing wrong with printing my tuple zero we actually did it earlier and it worked right it's fine because we're not trying to change anything with that right so if I just take this away do this then we'll do this we'll see that it's fine it goes all it, it continues it does those two lines right because the the line that's an error has been I commented it out so the interpreter is not trying to execute that line anymore right so it, it goes right on by that there's that's a little debugging technique when you think you found or you're trying to find a place where an error is happening, you can start commenting things out around it to see if those things are causing the error. And then once you kind of diagnose where the error is, then you can try to start you know, make a modification to that to prevent the error. Okay, so bump, bump, bump. It looks like uh, these all work as usual. And then here, if I had a function calling this function, <laughs> as before, I'll just quickly mention the same thing. If I had a function that was returning a function, uh, that was calling this function, and this, that function, or this particular function, my called uh, my tuple function, if it was performing some operation on the elements, who knows what it's doing? Maybe this function's intention is to do the square of every element. If, there, if we knew that there were numbers in there, right, integers or something, um, then it, it could, rather than printing those numbers, which would be a bad idea, right, because we don't know that the calling function, the function which called this one, if it wants those values printed or not, we should let that function who did the calling determine what it wants to do with the results. Right, and not and not kind of try to second guess or, or 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 front front run it. And I think we know what it's trying to do. We don't know what anyone's trying to do with this function. Right, all we know, if this function were accepting a tuple of integers, and all it was supposed to be doing was squaring each and every one of those integers in the tuple, then it it should just return the tuple to the caller with all the integers squared. It shouldn't print them, right? I'm, I'm trying to be very clear about that because I'm using this function and doing a lot of printing, but that's just, I'm just doing that because it's a, a it's something for the class, right? This, if, I, if this was a real production environment here and I was writing code for somebody, um, I, I would not be printing in here. So I just wanted to be clear on that. I know I've said it before, but I, I, maybe I can't say it enough to really uh, <laughs> ensure that the point gets across. All right, so hopefully uh, this makes a difference uh, or makes sense to you. Not a difference, makes sense. Um, the, the tuple is immutable. Aside from that, it works just like 
uh, the list. Right? So it's a way to make your elements immutable. All right, and we'll do sets, set next. 